It is good to see you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Pastor Jason, as Pastor Josh said. Glad you guys are here. Thank you for being here uh, for week two of our series called Plugged In. Um, one last time, can we just celebrate um, the star of Fuse this semester? I mean, absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, like Pastor Chris, I was, I was able to be there, and it, it was an awesome, awesome experience. Um, there were six individuals um, that, I, that I saw that I gave their life to Christ for the first time. And it was just so, so cool um, to be a part of that moment. And as they already said, hundreds and hundreds of students connecting um, into ministry. And so um, be praying uh, for that. And for those of you that are part of Fuse, thank you guys so much for reaching the campus. It means everything. And and for any of you who are considering small groups, guys, um, today uh, we are continuing plugged in. And I'm gonna go ahead and give you the, the, the end, like at the very beginning. We're gonna be talking today about being plugged into the church about how important it is for us to be a people of community and connection to one another, just like it's important for us to be a people of community and connection to Jesus. So if you weren't here week one, uh, plugged into Christ, number one, he is the vine, we are the branches, we can do nothing outside of him. Uh, Jesus' best description is, and this is just, it's scary, and some of you should be scared, and, and you know, so I just wanna be honest with you, I love you, but I wanna be honest with you. Like, I, I, I know some Christians that if they were really, really honest, they would have to admit they're not very abiding in Christ. And what Jesus said about that, if that's you, if that's you, he says, when a vine is not connected, I mean, when a branch is not connected to the vine, all it's good for is to be thrown out and burned in the fire. And that was his words. And so um, it's so important for us to have a real, intimate, daily abiding in Jesus. Someone please say amen to that, by the way, okay? But then secondly, and, and, and it's just equal in importance, um, is that we have an abiding connection to one another. And so we're going to be talking about that today. Um, and so I wanted to let you know, some of you are going to feel like this is one big commercial. And if you feel that way, that I can't help your heart, um, I love you. And I want every single one of you to have everything that Jesus has for you. And I'm telling you, connection to him and connection to his church are two of the greatest blessings and gifts um, that exist on the planet. And so really excited to dive in. Let's pray. And we're going to jump into his word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for this time. Um, and Jesus... It is, it is awesome, it is awesome that we have the right and the ability to abide and be connected to you. Um, and I thank you for that. I, I, we, we don't deserve to be able to call you father and friend and yet you give it to us. And then not only do you give us yourself, which is more than enough, but you have created this, this perfect, beautiful thing called the, the church, the, your bride, and it's made up of broken people just like me. And we can be connected to each other. And somehow by being connected and plugged into each other, we can become more together than we could ever be alone. And I, so I just pray, help me to explain this well. Help me to, 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 to push this well. This, this is a time of year. It's kind of a reset for, for so many of us in so many ways. Um, so many parents getting back in the school routine. Our students are back and they're getting into their routine. This is a chance for us to do all those things that we know we should do for us to make all those choices that we know we should make. And I just pray, Jesus, that, that you would be in the center of the choices that we make in this season. And so be here. We invite you in your name together say, amen, amen. Now, guys, some of you who are old-time igniters, you notice I didn't do something I normally do. Typically, the moment I say good morning, night, I get you guys to stand up. I get you to high five. I get you to hug people. And some, some of you are, are, are like, man, what, what happened? Did he forget? No, I didn't forget. No, I didn't forget. Um, some of you are missing that. Um, raise your for real. I'm serious, raise your hand if you're missing that, if you're here in the house and you're missing, okay, a couple of you, okay. Some of you are like really, really thankful you don't have some stranger hugging you. You can raise, you know, raise your hand, I'm really thankful. I don't have, yeah, okay. And others of you, it's like, it's fine either way. Um, today, we're not gonna do that. We're just not gonna do that. And, and, and it's on purpose. Um, now, normally, uh, if you wanna know the heart of that, there actually is a reason for that. It's not just for me to collect myself, though. I do collect myself in that time. So I'll, you know, you know speak, speaker's tip. If you're up speaking in front of a group of people and you're a little bit nervous, a great way to stop being nervous is just to get them interacting with each other and with you. And then it's just like, you're not nervous anymore. So there's, there's reality of that. But also, it always impressed upon me uh, ever since I entered into ministry that people are coming into the house of God and they're seeking different things. And a lot of time when we come into the house of God, we don't even know what we're really seeking. We're just seeking something. And, um, when, and one time as I was praying, and I really believe it was God's voice, I don't hear him audibly. Some of you do, and I very much honor that. He, he speaks to my heart. Um, I really felt like the Lord had told me that there are people that come into our church every week that they have, nev- they have not all week received a loving touch. 
You see, I, I take it for granted. I have uh, four kids and an incredible wife. I get touched too much. Like, you know, like there, there are things hanging off of me at any given moment. Um, literally, my, my youngest are still young enough that daddy's knee and lap and back is like a chair to them. And like, they're always on me. But there may be some of you, let's just get real. Like, you know, you, you, you wake up in an apartment by yourself, you go to a job and you interact with people, but you're not like, you know, you're not high five and you're not hugging, you're not handshaking a lot. You might be in a cubicle. Like you come home and, 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 and you're with yourself and, you know, Apple TV or Netflix or whatever. Like, that's just, that was your week. And that, that's a lot of Americans, that's their week. For someone just to extend a hand to someone like that and have a human touch, there is a power in that. And so I want to encourage you when service is over to, to go and do what we normally do at the beginning, do it at the end to do it at the end because you want to, not because the pastor kind of made you or asked you to. And if you're watching this online, again, we're glad you're watching online, but you know, if you're by yourself, I'd say you know, go watch this somewhere public. Go to a Starbucks or somewhere because there's just something about people that bless us and that we need. And we're gonna talk about that today. So no further ado, go ahead and pull out your app if you haven't already. We're gonna be in the Word of God. We're starting off with a proverb to get us going here. And, and I wanna give you our main point um, as, as you get to that. If you don't have our app, please download it. Everything will be on the screens for those of you who like to take notes um, as well. But here's kind of the, the, the main point for our series. When something needs power to work, it must be plugged in. And so we, we introduced that last week. We're gonna keep bringing that back up. We're, we're not gonna have any crazy illustrations or example of that. We did that last week. Um, but the truth is you are, you are something powerful, but for you to have the power that God intended for you to have, you have to be plugged into him, plugged into each other and plugged into the Holy Spirit. And that's just the way that it works. And so if any of you came in today and the reason why you came in again was, you know what? I, I'm a Christian, but I just know there's more. You feel a little powerless. It could be because you're just not abiding and being plugged in into one of these key things. And we wanna help you to do that today. So if you will, look at me at Proverbs 13, 20. This is a proverb that's one of my favorites when it comes to community and to our need for one another. It says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. That is a beautiful, eloquent, poetic saying uh, for what my mama, a Southern lady, she, 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 my mom had, had a lot of Southern-isms and probably your mamas did too if she was from the South. But one of the things that my mom would tell me and Chris and Beth all the time is that if you play in garbage, you're gonna smell like trash. And she just said that all the time. So like, just be careful who your friends are because if you play in garbage, you're gonna come out of it smelling like trash. And it's just, you know, like, it's just, it's just the truth. And we all know that in the physical, yeah, that's just, it's impossible to go swimming in, in trash without carrying some trash with you home. When it comes to our relationships, spiritually and socially, I'm telling you, whatever you're swimming in, you're gonna carry it home with you. And so if you're, if, you're, if you're swimming in a compromising crowd, you're going to become a person of compromise. If you're swimming in a crowd that, that likes to, you know, play a little bit edgy and dangerous, well, you're probably gonna carry that edginess and that danger with you. If you're surrounded with people who love God and are passionate about knowing him, you're gonna have a natural passion that comes into you. If you have people around you that are devoted to the word of God, and man, they're, they're, they're throwing out verses left, right, and center, you're gonna find yourself wanting to know more and study more. It's the way that it is as a human. Um, and so it's important for us to realize some of these truths. God made us with intent and purpose. And one of the main intents and purposes that God made for us was to have fellowship with him and with one another. And it's just, and so uh, again, t today I'm gonna be saying a lot of things you already know. I'm gonna be repeating them. I'm gonna be kind of reinforcing some of the things that Pastor Josh brought to you in that commercial break. You need people who love Jesus in your life. And I know some of you are immediately pushing back and saying, well, Jason, I thought we were supposed to be evangelists. I mean, look at the shirt that I'm wearing, talking about sharing. Yeah, yes, yes, you should have people on a list that you are taking to Jesus every day. You should be devoted to them and praying for them and reaching out to them, but that should not be your tribe. Let me say that again. The people that you are reaching out to in the name of Jesus should not be the tribe that you're relying on. They should not, because, because it, get, it gets too messy. And the truth is, if you are someone filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God, do you really wanna get counsel and wisdom from someone who is not? And, and the answer should be no. Even if they're great people, we love them and we reach out to them, but we need other believers that are in our life. And so, with no further ado, let me go ahead and give you a couple of reasons uh, why community is important. Community is so important. Number one, most important reason, because you might be one friend away 
from changing the course of your destiny. Now, that, that, that saying isn't mine. That's from Craig Grishel, uh, pastor of Life Church. He says that all the time. And so I just blatantly stole it from him. And if, you guys, if any of you, again, public speakers, a little tip. You know, here, here's how the rules of public speaking. The first time that you introduce someone else's saying, you need to give them credit. All God's people need to say amen to that. We don't, you know, amen to that. You give them credit. The second time you say their saying, you say, as I've said before, and then, you know, and then you say the saying. And the third time that you say their saying, you say, as I've always said. And it becomes your own saying, and it's, it's free game, and it's yours. So, you know, so if you hear this in the future, I might not always reference Pastor Craig. Um, if you don't know who he is, guys, he's who I want to be when I grow up. Um, he, is, he is my man crush. He is my hero. Um, he's an incredible minister uh, of, of God, and I, and, I, and I love him. I've had the blessing of meeting him a couple of times. I don't know him personally very well, um, but he's doing amazing things for Jesus. But let me read this verse to you. This, this, this story illustrates... Yeah, the truth is, you, you, are, you really could be one relationship away from God bringing something into your life that will forever change the course and the destiny of your life. Acts 9, 26 through 28. It says, when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. So where we're picking up our story is this man, Saul, who hated the church and who you know, imprisoned Christians and even killed Christians. He had the Damascus Road experience from Jesus. Jesus you know, basically confronted him, blinded him. Uh, you know, a miracle was done. His eyesight was restored. And now Saul, who has become Paul, is trying to do the thing that Jesus has commissioned him to do. The problem is everyone's terrified of him. This was the guy that was rounding up and arresting Christians. And so when he tries to go and say, hey, I'm one of you, they're like, yeah, right, good try. And they're not believing him. So, but Barnabas, Barnabas, who was a mature believer, well thought of by the saints, Barnabas took him and he brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly, in the name of the Lord. So some of you will be like, well, what's the big deal about this? Well, we take for granted that this man named Paul wrote more than half of our New Testament. So much of what we know of the gospel, so much of what we know about the Christian living, how to, how to be a disciple of Jesus, is directly an influence from this guy named Paul. And the truth is, in what we just read, he might have quit. He might have quit if not for one guy named Barnabas. Now, most of you are like, Barnabas who? Barnabas didn't write any letters. There's no books of the Bible named after him. We don't have a lot more uh, knowledge of his story. Where history really isn't given to us how he died. We don't know if he died as a martyr or not. He's one of those guys that kind of dies out into anonymity. But because he was willing to be a friend to Paul and say, hey, I vouch for this guy. This guy's one of us. This guy, you need to teach him, you need to train him, you need to invest in him, you need to pray for him, and you need to send him out. If Barnabas hadn't been there, the missionary journeys might never have happened. The letters might never have happened. All that, all that has influenced us from, this, from Paul's life might never have happened. Some of you might be called to be a Paul. And man, I, I'm, I'm praying for you. We need people who are planting churches. We need people who are writing theology. We need people who are doing big, big things for Jesus. Others of you might be a Barnabas, and the Barnabases are maybe more important than the Pauls because they empower, they lift up, and they encourage the Pauls. Um, in my own life, there have been people who have come alongside me, believed in me, and push me forward and encourage me. And I'm, I'm gonna share a couple of those, but I just want you to just kind of have that concept. The truth is, those of you who feel like you're too busy for a small group, for instance, boom, boom, commercial. Yeah, like, you think you're too busy, and I get it, you are busy. You are busy. I, I have four kids in three different schools this year. Y'all pray for me and for the Lineberger household. It's busy. It's absolutely busy. Um, my, my brother, Pastor Chris, um, you wanna talk about one relationship changing his destiny. Um, many of you know uh, we are two churches in one, uh, we're one church in two locations. We have a Chocolinity church. And the, the, the campus pastor of that church is a guy named Greg Homburg. His wife, his name is Lee. And, and the Homburgs are an amazing family. And one of the things that God had particularly called the Homburgs to do is they, they foster children. Um, they foster children who, who, who need help. Um, and I'm not, I know it wasn't the, the sole influence of the Homburgs, but um, any of you guys who know um, my brother Chris, uh, Pastor Chris, and his wife, um, they also have a call fostering, and they, th this inspired them to actually do something about their, their call. And, um, and they've just been certified, and um, they, they, they have foster kids living with them now. Um, their whole life, 
is, has been radically shifted because a few people ha, ha, have had this thing in their life that they feel like God was saying, you need to have that thing in your life. You could be one relationship away from having everything in your life change in such a positive Jesus kind of way. And so I wanna look at three different types of community that you need to have as a part of the church. And in the church, guys, Ignite Church is a big church. I'm not gonna lie to you, especially if you're visiting today. Ignite Church is a pretty big church. Um, last week, we had, I think, 683 people in this service and like 672 or something like that in, in the 11 o'clock service. So there's a lot of people here. That's just the adults. That's just in this room. Um, there's a lot of people here. You can have community if you seek it, but if you just come in and expect it to come to you, it will never come to you. And it's not that we don't love you. I just wanna tell you the truth and say, well, how do I find it? If you're willing to join a small group or willing to serve, you will have a tribe. And you, will, you will have a tribe. Um, and we want you so much to have that. And here are three friends that you need to have. Number one, guys, those of you like to take notes, three types of friends. Number one, you need a Ruth in your life. And a Ruth, I would describe a Ruth as a friend that always has your back. A Ruth is a friend that always has your back. Someone that through thick and thin is going to be with you till the end. You, every one of us, every human, we need someone like that in our life. If you're ever wondering, like, why is it? Why is it that, you know, the, the, the media can make a show like this? This was one of my favorite ones when it was on. Anybody, How I Met Your Mother, anybody remember? Yeah, that show. Yeah, they made four, like 400 episodes of that show, like le legitimately. Like, how in the world is that possible that people would want to keep coming back and coming back and coming back? If it's, how much, how about friends then? If, you know, if, how much, how much, like, there's, why do you like that show? Because deep down, you know you need some friends like in Friends. <laughs> or deep down, you know you need some friends like in How I'm, the, the, if you've never seen the show, it's about a group of friends. Um, back, if those of you who are a little bit older, you know, man, cheers, like, you know, you know, sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. You know, it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're always glad you came. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not gonna get somebody's name wrong today. Y'all were hoping it would happen. It's not, okay. But I'll still sing for you. So those shows, those shows, those shows, and they're like, again, we're just, they, the 10 season long shows, what do all of them have in common? They're about friendship. And the reason why America keeps coming back to it, The Office is another more modern one. If you ever wonder, like, why am I so obsessed with this? It's not about The Office. It's about friends. It's about friendships and relationships. We need that. And one of the types of friends you need is a friend that will always have your back. If you'll read with me in Ruth chapter one, this is the beginning of the story um, of Ruth. It says, Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there, are there still sons in my womb that they could be your husbands? In other words, so if you remember the beginning of the story, Ruth is this you know, young woman that she, she was married to, um, married to an Israelite man, um, and the man that she was married to died. And um, so Ruth gets stuck with a mother-in-law instead of a husband. And, and, and Ruth's mother-in-law, who's an Israelite woman, is saying, listen, Ruth, you're not, even, you're not even the tribe of Israel. You need to go back to your family because there, I don't have any more sons to marry you to. I don't have anything to offer you. We're gonna be poor. We might be in poverty. Like, you need to go back and look at the kind of person that Ruth was. Ruth said to Naomi, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following you. Here's the declaration. For wherever you go, that's where I will go. Wherever you lodge, that's where I'm gonna lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, that's where I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Now, we often read verses like this at something like a wedding where we all understand it's supposed to be a lifetime commitment. But Ruth was not saying these words to her husband. She was saying these words to a mother-in-law she had no blood relation to. Ruth was declaring friendship with Naomi. And Naomi, Naomi was someone that on her own the only thing that was awaiting her was poverty and, pro and probably death. And Ruth was a young woman who respected and honored and loved her. And so what she basically said is, listen, I have learned from you. You have mentored me. You have poured into me. And I'm telling you, I'm with you till the very, very end. So you guys write this down. Chemistry is circumstantial. Commitment is a choice. See, often, when we, what we, often what we're looking for in friends is we're looking for people who like the things that we like, enjoy the things that we enjoy, are interested in the things we're interested in. So that, that's chemistry. And chemistry, y'all, is good. It's good to have chemistry. But you don't just need friends that have chemistry with you because those friends might have chemistry with you, and when tough circumstances come, they might be out. What you need is someone who will be committed to you, who will love you, who will pray for you, who will be devoted to you no matter what. And that's a choice. And so again, some of you, I'm just gonna be real with you. Some of you, 
<laughs> you get frustrated with small groups at Ignite because we, make, we let you know what's available. You go and check some out and you come back and you say, well, I just, I don't know if I really liked anybody there. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like they were weird or they were older or they were younger or they had kids and you don't or they didn't have kids and you do. And it just was a little bit of tension. And with all the love in my heart, y'all, y'all listen up, from Pastor Jason to you, I don't care. I don't care. That's not the point. It's not, the point of small group is not for you to hang out with people like you. The point of small group is for you to be with people who love Jesus like you and then who will love you and be committed to you. And it doesn't matter if they're in the same stage of life as you. It doesn't matter if they have the same circumstances as you. It doesn't matter if they like the same TV shows as you. You can find people who like the same TV shows as you. You need someone who when life is hard, they will pray to Jesus for you. That's what you need. And that's what I need. And so don't worry, don't worry. And that's why I get some of you, you don't wanna be small group leaders because you're afraid you're just not cool enough or whatever. No, people don't need someone cool. They need someone who will actually be committed to their life. If you're willing to do that, you'd be a great leader. That's what we're looking for. And, you, and if, if you need that, I, I need that in my life. People who have my back. One of the people that um, I know has my back is, is on our staff. Well, you know, one of the privileges of starting something, I'm just gonna be a little, it's a little bit of a joke and it's a little bit serious too. So y'all can judge me on the internet if you want to. And I'll, it'll be fine. Um, you know, um, one of the great things about starting a business is that when you see people who do have the qualifications, because that's important, but that also are your friends. You, I, I get to hire some of my friends sometimes and it's great. Um, and one of the guys that I got to do that to is, is uh, Pastor Josh Faulkner. Y'all, y'all know him. He's our disciple pastor. He was the guy on the video. Um, I knew him when he had just come into faith in Jesus. And he was a young guy, um, just getting out of school. And to be be frank, um, I remember the first time I had a conversation with him. He was extremely zealous for Jesus. And he was one of those guys that after the service came up to me and was like, hey, will you give me some time? I wanna be in ministry. And I'll be honest with you. um, When people will do that to me, my immediate response is, you think you're gonna be in ministry, but you're probably not. Because if you can do anything other than ministry, I would say do it because ministry is so hard. <laughs> now, if God's called you to do it, you're gonna be miserable doing anything else. But if you can do anything else, I'd say do it, because it is so, so, so hard. Um, and, 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 and Because people are hard, and I'm a person too, so I'm saying we are all hard. And so um, I, I kind of blew uh, Pastor Josh off at first. And I said, oh, well, you know, get your seminary degree and we'll talk. And he actually went and got a seminary degree and, and he came back. And I, I had the joy of baptizing him. I had the joy of officiating um, his wedding to his incredible wife, Catherine. Um, I've been able to see them bring two beautiful boys into this world. And just, like, I've been able to see this young man grow up into this incredible, like, man of faith. And the truth is, he, he could go and pastor anywhere. Y'all heard him speak. He's awesome. Can we get an amen at Pastor Josh? Can, like, he can do it, y'all. He's, he's awesome. You know he's a great disciple maker. He leads in so much. Um, he could do anything and go anywhere. And he, he believes in what we're doing. And even if he did, was called to leave, he'd be my friend forever. I know he, he's that person that always has my back. You need someone that will always have your back. Um, you need a, a, a Ruth to your Naomi. Um, number two, guys, you need a Jonathan. A Jonathan is a friend who reminds you of God's promises, who is close to God and will keep encouraging you and reminding you to be who God called you and made you to be. And again, if, if you don't know a whole lot about the friendship of Jonathan and David, um, it is a beautiful friendship. Um, but from what the Bible gives us, just being frank with you, from what the Bible gives us, it's largely a one-sided friendship. Jonathan very rarely relies on David, but David relies heavily on Jonathan. God placed Jonathan in David's life to be an encouragement. David was the anointed king well and above and beyond far before a crown was ever put on his head. And Jonathan, the son of the current king, believed that. So think about this. Jonathan was such an exceptional person. Even though he had the legal right to be the heir to the throne, he knew that God had called David. And instead of being resentful to David, he believed in David. He prayed for David. He supported David. He stood up against his own father, the king who could have had him killed on behalf of David. We need friends that believe more in us than we often believe in ourselves, And that's the kind of thing that Jonathan did. And again, you, you, can't, you can't find those kind of friends out there. And I'm not trying to say, it's not a cult thing. I'm not trying to say, like, become one of us. No, like, it's not one of those things. It's just the truth. Like, like this type of friendship, this type of, this type of friendship, it just doesn't exist in a broken world. It's a divine thing, and we need it in our story. So let me just read one example of this from, from their story. There's so many passages I could have picked for this, by the way. First Samuel 23, 15 through 17 says, while David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, 
He learned that Saul had come out to take his life. So bad day, bad day, we can all agree. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen to you today. If so, I'll pray for you <laughs> and not get involved. Anyway, 16, and Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and he helped him find what? Strength in God. So, so, so David is on the run from Saul. Saul is there to hunt him down and take his life. Meanwhile, Saul's son, Jonathan, who loved David like his own life, comes to David and says, listen, listen, why are you worried? Why are you worried about what my dad's doing? Is my dad your God? No. Well, who did God say that you are, David? Well, the king, I guess. Do you think your God is so weak that he can call you king and not put the crown on your head? No, I guess not. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. We, we tout David all the time, giant slayer, and he was. You know, writer of all the Psalms, and he was. Greatest king, perhaps, of all of Israel's history, and he was. But he was a guy that was scared of Saul until Jonathan came and said, you're scared of the wrong person. You got a God you should be scared of. But my dad, my dad, his army, you shouldn't be scared of any of them. He said to him, don't fear the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you. Why? Because you will be king of Israel. And look at this. And man, this almost gets, brings tears to my eyes because unfortunately it did not come to pass. And I shall be next to you. I'll be next to you. He died before that could come to pass. Even my father deep down knows that. Even my father knows the truth. That one day you, David, will sit on the throne. And then I'm going to be right there beside you. By and by, it will be really cool to hang out with the two of them in heaven one day. Can we get an amen to that? That's gonna be really, really cool. You need a friend that's gonna be able to speak God's promises over your life. You can write this down. A friend on the mount, be a friend on the mountaintop so you can have a friend in the valley. And the reason why I wanted to give you that phrase, that's, that's, a, me, that's a me thing right there. So if it's not good, then yeah, get over it. It's okay. Um, I, I, I've had so many people who are searching for friendship and they can't find it. And the problem, if you're searching for friendship and you can't find it, and again, I wanna give you so much love because it is hard. In this digital age, in this disconnected age, it is so hard to find real friends. It is so hard to find real connections. And that is so true, y'all. And so, I mean, I mean it when I say I pray for our church that we will be connected to one another because it is hard to do. But, I mean, just from, from my heart to your heart, the way to find friends is to be a friend. It's to be a friend. Often we are looking for someone to bring something to us. Why don't I ever get invited? Why don't they ever do anything for me? Why don't I ever get called? Why don't I, whatever. When's the last time you invited? When's the last time you text? When's the last time you called? When's the last time you encouraged? When's the last time you cooked? When's the last time you, whatever that thing is that you wish was more in your life, why don't you do it first? Because if you'll, if you'll be a friend to others, then when you need a friend, I promise you'll have friends. You'll have them there. We need a friend who reminds you of God's promises. If you want to know who one of the people um, who is that in, in my life, and I know this is a weird one because it is it's, it's family too, but yeah, Chris is one of those guys. If y'all don't know Pastor Chris well, um, the, the passion that he brings on the stage, it is none of it's stage. This isn't stage Chris. It's just Chris Chris. Chris is the guy that I'll go into his office. I'll be walking by and he's listening to some song about how good Jesus is and he's just crying. Like, I mean, it's, it's just, and it's just, that's just real. Like he, he just so, he's, he's got more gifts of faith than any man I've ever met in my entire life. And I, I mean, like, he, like I, I, I try to be positive, but I'm honest with you. I wanna be honest with you. I sometimes see the doom and the gloom and what could, the problems. Chris is one of those like, no, if God told us to do it, we can do anything. And he just really believes that. If God's told us to do something, Jason, then it doesn't matter what obstacles are against it. The mountains, they're just gonna fall flat on their face in front of us. He believes that. And I need somebody like, because I, I, don't, I don't naturally think that way. I see mountains sometimes. And I'm like, man, that's gonna be really hard to climb. And Chris is the guy that's like, well, either God's gonna knock it down or he's gonna give us the strength to jump over it. But we're going either way. And you need someone like that in your life. And then, and then finally, um, the last one, Samuel. Um, Samuel, I represent him as a friend who sees God's greatness in you. In other words, again, he sees, he sees the thing in you that has not yet come to be but could be. If you don't know much about uh, the story of Samuel, Samuel was the, uh, the prophet that anointed David. And out of all the people that, 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 that God could have chosen, that Samuel could have chosen, David was not the most qualified. The not, he wasn't the best looking. He wasn't the tallest. He wasn't the strongest. He wasn't the most famous. He wasn't the most educated. He was a regular guy. And Samuel saw something unique and special in him. In 1 Samuel 16, 12, it says, the Lord says, rise and anoint him, David. This is the one. 
And so Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And, and, and so, and again, I don't wanna read too much into this. There is definitely a special anointing and supernatural presence that came upon David when Samuel anointed him. And I fully believe that. And I, I, just want, I, don't want, I want that to be really, really clear. But I do think there's another part to this. There's another practical part to this. It's interesting we will never, ever be more than the people around us think that we can be. That's just a truism of life. We will, we will never be. We will never be more than the people around us believe that we can be. Some of you, you grew up in homes where your parents believed you could be anything. And, it, and, it, and it, when, when you have that type of environment, it elevates you up to reach those beliefs. Others of you, you come from backgrounds where, I mean, being real with you, some people are like, yeah, I'm not nothing and you're not ever gonna be nothing either. And it's really hard to get past that glass ceiling. We need people around us that can, that can believe that we can be whatever the thing is that we're not yet. So I say to my brothers, I say to my brothers, you wanna be a man of God? Find some men of God that believe you can be and you will become what they believe. You wanna be a great husband, sister? You wanna be a great wife, a great woman of God? Find some brothers or some sisters that believe that and will believe that about you and you will rise up to their expectations. You wanna be a great parent? Find some parents, and they're not perfect, but find some parents that are, that are working hard to do it the Christ way and who believe you can do the same thing and together you guys will elevate up into who you want to be. You guys can, uh, can just take this to the bank again. Famous verse, Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens one another. In other words, like it just, as we rub up against other people, it just makes us, it makes us something better than we could ever be alone. And last statement, um, you can get somewhere in life without a mentor, just never where God wants you to be. You can get somebody. So you need somebody. You need somebody. You need somebody that you are encouraging them. You need somebody that's believing in you. Um, you need somebody that's a little farther along than you. All of us need that. And if you're wondering who is that in my life, um, Pastor David Naum, the founder of TTI, is that in my life, guys. Um, and so uh, he is somebody that I regularly talk to. He texts me uh, just about every single week. He believes in our church. And if you don't know who Pastor David is um, and what Timothy Initiative is, it is a missions organization that has planted, uh, last I checked, about 150,000 churches. I, it's hard to keep up with the numbers because they keep growing so fast. Right now, I know he's training 180,000 church planters. And so they're about to double <laughs> their church plants. And he, he knows of us. And he believes that God's gonna do great things in us. And David, Pastor David's one of those guys that he's a little older than me. And I just look at what he's doing and it's like, he's reaching hundreds of thousands of people. And I can't imagine doing that. And I'll be honest, I mean, just, he believes that we are going to have much bigger influence than we currently have and reach a lot more people than we currently do. And I need, like, whether that happens or not, I need somebody that, believe it, that can believe it can. We all say amen to that. Like, I, 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 it, it's up to God what he does with this, this thing. It's already so good. And I, and I love y'all and I love it so much. But we're not a big church. Now, some of you, you feel like we are because you came from a little church, but we're not a big church. Fuse is not a big campus ministry. It's great that there were, almost, that there were over 600 people. It's great there were over 600 people, but there's 25,000 that go to ECU alone, much less 15,000 that go to Pitt Community College. We're not a big campus ministry. We got tens of thousands more people to reach. Someone say amen to that. Like, yeah, we're, yeah, you feel like we're a pretty big church when I say that maybe you know, we're somewhere, getting, we're getting close to that 2,000 mark. But right here in Pitt County alone, there's almost 180,000 people that live in this community. We're not a big church. We just got a big vision and we wanna reach a lot more people for Jesus. And I, I believe that God can do incredible things and into and through us. So what do we do now? <laughs> now, you need to make a decision. And we're gonna worship in just a moment. I'll ask you to stand up. But before we do that, I wanna, I wanna give you time to make a decision. And I don't care what time it is on the clock, <laughs> honestly. Um, I want you to make a decision. There are so many of you in this room, you know you need to get connected to people. And I have clearly told you, if Ignite's your place to do that, here's how you do it. You serve on a team, or you become part of a small group. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. And I promise you, if you will do that, you will find connections and community and people. I mean, just, just a few minutes before the service started, the, the, our, the praise band and the production team, we were all in circle prayer. They, we know each other. They know each other. They're talking to each other. They're praying for each other. They're sharing life together because they're serving together. Our small groups, they know each other. They have refrigerator rights with each other. They can see each other's bare feet and it's not, you know, uh, mortifying. Like, like, if you want people to know you, if you want people to know your kids' names, 
That's how you do it. And so on, on the chair in front of you, um, you might notice a QR code. Um, if you actually would just pull out your phone and cut on your camera there, and if you're doing this online, everything's on the app where you can sign for this as well. If you'll just cut on your phone and just point it at that, it'll take you to a link where you can let us know if you're interested in a small group. You can let us know if you're interested in exploring um, a, a place of service. We want you to be connected. And if any of you are a little critical and thinking, man, this is just a plug to fill up his groups and to fill up his service teams, you can think whatever you're going to think. But I'll just tell you this. If all you ever do is come in and out of this dark room and you wonder why you feel so alone, surrounded by people, it's because you're not taking me up on the offer I'm making to you right now. <laughs> like, I wish with all my heart. Now, y'all might not wish it could... One Jason in the world is enough. Please say, y'all say amen to that. But I sometimes, I wish I could multiply myself and have a relationship with all of you. I mean, like, I, I, I would love to know you more. Well, look, but there's no way all of you can have a personal relationship with me. But you can with someone. You can with someone. And you don't need me. I'm really weird. <laughs> but you all need someone. And I want all of you to have someone that's praying for you, that knows you, that loves you, that believes in you, and that will fight hard spiritually for you. And so please take a minute and, and, and do that. Sign up. If, if you look for a group and we have trouble finding a group for you, we will keep working to find a place for you. If you're willing to serve, man, we will find a place to put you in. And I promise you will be so blessed. I'm going to close in prayer. Our prayer team's always available. And then we're going to stand up and we're going to worship you. Heavenly Father.